<laughs> so, uh, in about 2008, I've been playing for eight years now, and now I love wearing trucker hats, but I would often get, you know, from weekends out in the sun, I would often get sunburned ears and sunburned back of the neck. And so, because I had some a little bit of a design background and some weak Photoshop skills, I'm like, you know what? I could really use a wide brim trucker hat. I love the breathability, I love the lightness, I love kind of the, the campy look and the fun sayings that you can find on them, but I need a little bit more sun protection. So what I did is I came up with this little photograph collage of uh, what was now the cowbucker. And it is essentially a cowboy brim and a trucker hat. It was as simple as that. Uh, showed it to my wife, she said, oh, that's a great idea. Um, and that was about it. I had no idea what to do with it. I was not a businessman. I was not a. St I had no idea how to take an idea to production. So it kind of just got put back on the shelf for a little while. Uh, fast forward a few years. Uh, I joined the UOVO MBA program in 2012 and started on the entrepreneurship track. So learning how to start a business, how to start a company. Uh, a year ago, almost exactly this week. So this is week two of the term. So. Last year, January, week one of winter term, uh, Derek and I and a couple other people were taking a new product development course where the professor said, what we're gonna do is as a kind of a case study, you're gonna come up with a product, real or invent, doesn't matter what it is, we're gonna take it through the process of figuring out how a company would weigh the idea of starting a new product, what, what are the processes they would go through. If you have an idea you know, for something, form a team around it, and we'll take it over the next 10 weeks and see what happens. And I thought about it, and I was like, oh yeah, I had that hat idea a few years ago. And so I kind of sketched it out on paper and showed it to a few people, and they said, all right, yeah, why not? Let's, let's run through that for the term. And so they, what we did was we tried to come up with some ideas behind it. What would this be? What could it be? Who would be a target market? A bunch of different exercises that we took it through. And each step we took it through, people, everybody we showed it to said, Oh, that's kind of a cool idea. You should run with it. We kind of kept getting this positive feedback, and our professor didn't help because he, he liked the idea too. <clears throat> so towards the end of that term, I actually made a physical mock-up, which was a piece of cardboard circle cut out and taped to an old trucker hat. So we kind of showed that around, and as stupid as it looked, people were like, I can kind of see that being a cool thing. So over the spring break of last year, so end of March, uh, my wife and I, Instead of going skiing like we had planned, we sat around, we went to Joanne Fabric, pulled up a bunch of old hats and started making prototype hat brims. And so at the beginning of spring term, I enlisted uh, Derek uh, and Whitney, our other partner, and he said, you know what, we've got 10 more weeks of this MBA education. Let's see if we can make it count and see how far we can get this idea in the next 10 weeks before we graduate. And I said, okay, let's do it. So. Ten months in the future. Ten months in the future. So that was, I mean, this was within 2014. Fast forward, we were able to get a lot of steam behind our idea. We met with some great people. We got licensing through the University of Oregon, which is no small feat considering the hurdles that licensing faces. They, you, they essentially said in their licensing letter, we normally wouldn't do this for a company that has no history, no production, no sales distribution, but we'll give you a shot. He <laughs> said, awesome, that's all we need. So we found a production partner through a local company here, production partner in mainland China, who produces the hats, and it took a few months for us to get that off the ground. Fast forward, beginning of football season, they're not quite ready. Fast forward a few more weeks, we launched October 2nd at the Arizona game which, as many of you know, was not a great game for the Ducks. Anyway, we launched our hat there, uh, and we have sold a little over 1,100 hats in the last three months or so. We've given away quite a bit in promotion, but we've sold quite a bit through uh, our partner, the Duck Store. They have seven physical locations around the state, as well as their online presence. And we'll talk a little bit more about them. So, we've gone quite a ways in the last year. Um, where we're standing right now is, okay, we've, we've done the college thing here. We know a lot of other schools that would be good fits for the Bucker. So these are some of the schools that we've been in touch with that are currently either working licensing or ordering new hats. 
Uh, so we've, <clears throat> we're looking to expand to 15 to 20 new schools for the next academic year. Uh, we're going to be hitting a few big trade shows in February and trying to get our hat out onto the collegiate market. So we've been talking with lots of different people, lots of different states, getting a lot of good feedback. People saying, yeah, we want that hat in Arizona colors or in South Carolina Gamecocks, things like that. So the collegiate market is kind of what we know. We were college students. We got in through Oregon Ducks. Since the Oregon is kind of the fashion forward school in the country right now, preeminent uh, design uh, status, uh, we've really enjoyed that, that kind of rise and people look to Oregon for new fashion. So here we are. Uh, so collegiate is kind of our main market. So why did you decide to do um, licensing through the universities rather than just having your own brand? <clears throat> so that's something that uh, we kind of looked at a, a, a pretty similar comp that came out of the business program called Shady Peeps. Um, and we're a little bit different than them, but they did a really great job of doing collegiate licensing, starting at Oregon and expanding out. And we saw that as kind of a similar model that we wanted to follow. Um, as Chris is about to say, we are kind of expanding into other markets that are unlicensed, promotional, and um, just a general unlicensed market. We felt we had a better chance of starting with collegiate um, and getting adoption in that 18 to 22 year old target market and then going into the promotional and unlicensed than the opposite way. Um, and I think we kind of felt that way because um, it's, I think if, if I'm a college student, I want something that's like kind of a new product um, rather than something that used to be you know, a promotional item now being adopted for collegiate purposes, whereas the opposite isn't as true. So that's kind of why we started with collegiate. Yeah, so that's kind of what this slide is all about. So this is this is where we're starting. It's what we know. It's what we have access to, and because we can attach ourselves to an already strong brand, we can sell a lot of hats quickly, gain a little bit more exposure than we would be able to with something like this or something like this. So that's why we've started where we've started. But our goal is to expand to a lot of different markets. So the other two are uh, the promotional which is finding companies who really want to sell something that promotes their company. We have Ninkasi here. They're a great local brand. They're really supportive of our idea. We're trying to work together on something. Uh, and then the unlicensed uh, market, which is doing things like the American flag or a state flag, something like this, a Texas hat, uh, where we have a much broader fan base or much broader market, um, but a little bit more diffuse. Uh, something like a collegiate market is a little bit smaller geographically, but very centralized. You have bookstores, you have an established distribution model, you have a lot of people who come to the same places to buy their gear. So it's really easy to get into one channel and hit a lot of people. Something like this, uh, which has a more diffuse base, we may have a larger, uh, may have a larger group of people who want to buy it, but there, you know, you have to figure out exactly who's going to buy this kind of hat where. And it's a little bit harder to do when you don't have the, uh, the reach that we do at this moment. So those are the kind of our three product market segments at the moment. So we have others in the pipeline, but this is what we're going to be hitting for now. So let's take a step back. So we're going to step back to even that first uh, new product development course that we were in. The biggest question was, okay, we've got this idea. We didn't really know what it was, but the first question they wanted us to look at was, who on earth is going to spend $100 on a hat like this? Now, obviously, we're not going to sell for $100, bucks, but who is going to be, who's going to get really excited about something like this? Is it going to be because of the function? Is it going to be because of the brand, whatever is on top of it? Uh, is it going to be because of the marketing we're doing? So we had a lot of questions that we didn't know how to answer. Thankfully, we were in a course that uh, was preparing us to do that. And we were encouraged right off the bat to start off with focus groups. So what we did was we asked, we got groups of undergrads, we brought them in, we gave them pizza and asked them questions. We showed them the prototypes and said, we have this great idea, what should we do with it? And we got a ton of feedback. Um, and the main one that we're showing here is we asked people, what do you see, what are the attributes of this hat? Can you describe this hat in one word or two words? What can you see yourselves doing in a hat like this? Where can you see it being worn? Where can you see it being really kind of at home? 
And we got a lot of great feedback from what we expected to be our target market, so college students. And they gave us all these words. The largest ones are the ones that recurred the most often. So you can see things like rafting as one, um, fishing, simple theme, game day, obviously was the big one. People say, hey, you put the ducks on that and I will buy it, which gave us a pretty big clue as to where we should start. Um, <laughs> America, a lot of people said this is a very American hat. I mean, cowboys, truckers, you put them together and you've got, this is the, the cow bucker. They like it because it's tacky too? They're delightfully tacky. <laughs> Not just tacky, but delightfully tacky in a way that people said, you know, the, especially the college kids looking for, like Derek said, that new thing. Hey, that's kind of cool. It flies in the face of style, fashion at this moment. I can get behind that. And so we said, well, we can get behind you getting behind that. And we'll move forward. So beer was one that we got a lot of, a lot of uh, enthusiasm behind. And so we'll jump into that. But college students and beer, we didn't want to jump into right away. So what, so after getting all of this feedback, people saying, this is where I would use it, this is what I can see, this is, these are the, the words that really describe it. We said, okay, we need to create a brand that encompasses a lot of those attributes. We wanna create a personality to our company that will really make people think of these set of things, fun, sun, and beer being kind of the main three. And so what we did over the summer was to kind of craft a message that we would get out to the people that would encompass those main attributes. So what we did is we came up with our video, which Derek will play. I don't know if we're gonna, are you gonna get audio on this? I think so. Think so? That's right. So see if you can find, this is the hints, see if you can find any of those words in this video. Not physically, but. Uh, let's see. No, that's good. So the so I'll, I'll skip ahead to the punchline. What we were trying to do is encapsulate all of those ideas into a single video, kind of the day in the life of Eugene, what people do here when they're when they're looking to have a fun day in the summertime. So we took everything that people said, this is what I can, not everything, but what I can see myself doing in this hat, we put it into one video to show people kind of the range of uses and places that this can fit into. It's not just a hat you wear at the game, it's not just a hat that you wear to support your team, but it's a hat that you can wear doing a number of different things, so trying to get it into their lifestyle by showing them how it would fit. suggestions that we weren't coming up with on our own. Things like, hey, what about a cord to keep it on my head when I don't want to wear it and I want to do it like this? Or, hey, can we make it so it floats because I want to be able to wear it on the river? We said, I think we can do that. And so we were able to do that, but we realized both, yes, there we can make a lot of great functions, but the real reason that people are buying it is not because of what it is, but because of what it says. So it's becoming, that was one of our kind of turning points in our thinking is this is, this is a billboard. This is a branding play. This is something that people are going to put what they care about on. 
So we need to figure out and position our company to be able to take the best advantage of that mindset. finding local partnerships, second was finding local advocates, third was um, engaging in local events, and fourth is, you know, hammering down on our social media. Um, and so we're a startup, we didn't have a lot of money, but we thought we could execute these four things pretty well and um, within our limited budget um, successfully. So the first is local partnerships, and um, one of those partners that we identified really, really early on was the Duck Store. Um, for a lot of obvious reasons, but the reasons that weren't as obvious that became apparent to us over, over our, um, the, the initial stages of our relationship um, was their incredible, incredible online presence. So um, you may or may not follow the Duck Store, but they have 80,000 Facebook follows. Um, they have 65,000 people on their listserv that they send to once a month. Um, they have seven phys physical um, brick and mortar stores in Oregon, um, and they have an online store, and uh, they're their physical stores and their online stores do a ton of business. Um, and a lot of that is driven through their Facebook um, and their email listserv. They're able to, to reach just such a massive amount of people um, and drive traffic to you know, their brick and mortar and to their online stores. And so we knew that if we could partner with those guys, it would be mutually advantageous to both of us. On their end, they, they get to promote a brand new product. And on our end, we get access to uh, the incredible reach that they have. Um, and so we've worked with them for the last three months, and it's been um, just absolutely awesome for us. Um, they highlighted us on one of their listservs. Um, they promoted us on the front of their uh, their uh, re uh, their uh, website. Um, they promoted us a bunch of times on Facebook, doing giveaways, um, talking about the different versions of our hats. And so we've been able to adopt somewhat of a uh, you know an early following just because the Duck Store has been so. Uh, helpful in getting us out there and working with us. So why why were they so helpful? Like why did they highlight you and not somebody else? I think they they try to highlight those products that they think will do the best. Um, and I think they saw this as kind of something that fit the Oregon brand. Um, it's kind of it's kind of an outdoorsy game day kind of thing. And you know we had the Oregon uh, light the the licensed marks that were on the hat. Um, and so I think they, they, they'll do this for products that they feel 
you know, stand a chance of selling well in their stores. Right, so they've, they work with a number of different student startups over the years. So Shady Peach slash Society 43, they help launch. Red Duck Ketchup, they help launch. So they have a history of really reaching out to the student population and helping things kind of take off. And part of the reason we got our licensing through the U of O is because we had talked with the duck store and they said that they would take a chance and place a purchase order for 150 hats right away. So that gave a little bit of market validation to the licensing department. They said, okay, we'll help give you a shot. If you've got if the duck stores behind it, they know what we'll sell, they know our standards, so we'll trust their judgment. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, look, I agree with all that. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, this is something that kind of fits their, their brand, too. Uh, it's, uh, it's fashion forward. Uh, it's, you know, the Oregon Duck Store tends to highlight those things that are kind of on the cutting edge whether it be like the new Nike jersey or, you know, like these compression socks or whatever. Uh, and I think this kind of, they were able to, they, were, they wanted to take a flyer on us because this was something new and something that hadn't been seen. And it was, like Chris said, we were just, you know, three kids coming out of the University of Oregon. So um, another one of the local partnerships that we identified is the UO Pit Crew. Um, so if you've been to any sporting event at the University of Oregon, you've probably seen the Pit Crew. Uh, they are at every single home game, and they're at quite a bit of away games, whether it be volleyball, uh, soccer, um, but most definitely basketball and football. Um, and uh, they've been incredible to us, too. They don't have quite the reach as the Duck Store, but um, they have 4,000 Facebook follows, 9,000 Twitter follows. Uh, and the important thing is that they have physical presence at the events that we're trying to reach um, within the target market that we're trying to go after, which is that 18 to 22 demographic. So, you know, every tweet that they bring out is going straight to the people that matter to us. Um, and so we've worked with them throughout the last few months on um, promotional giveaways. Um, they've highlighted our video in a couple of their, uh, like their hats, with their, uh, or a couple of their videos that they're, they're doing um, uh, just to show off the different chants and the cheers. Um, so that's been a, a great partnership for us also. <coughs> the second prong um, was finding local advocates. Yes. As you expand to other colleges and or even other product yeah. niches, how do you how do you expect to find these local advocates and local promoters? So that's we'll get there. Yeah, we have a we'll we have a slide dedicated to that. Um, but that's a great question. That's something that we're constantly talking about. Um, in order for because the strategies worked here, I think naturally we want to bring that and onboard to the other programs that we go to, but. Um, you know, that's something that we struggle with because our reach is so good here um, and not so strong at Arizona or Boise State. So, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so the second prong is finding local advocates. Um, here is Duck Knott wearing our hat. You might know Duck Knott. He's the NCAA Fan of the Year uh, a couple of times. Um, we got him to wear hats at a couple of the games and a couple of his crew and posse to wear the hats and take photos. Uh, you might recognize Anthony Thomas, the fastest man in football, and we kind of targeted to Anthony Thomas very early on. We thought, uh, do, do you guys, I guess, familiar with Anthony Thomas? He came out of the program last year. He now plays professional football for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, he was kind of the face of Oregon there for a while. He's um, got an incredible Twitter feed. Yeah, his yeah, Twitter feed. Yeah. yeah, his Twitter feed is like ninety-nine thousand people. His Instagram, it's just tons of tons of people love Anthony Thomas, and so we thought it would be awesome if we could get him. Um, sporting a couple of our cowbuckers, so so we reached out to, to Anthony Thomas on Twitter. We we showed him a link to our you know our website and um, asked him, hey, do you want a couple of these hats? And um, he responded right away, direct message, private message. He said, I would love some of these hats. Can you send them to the practice facility in uh, Kansas City? Um, so we we're like, sure, what colors do you want? And he told us the colors, and we sent them off. We sent off a couple. Um, he. And then we, when we set them off, we, you know, we took, we took a photo. It's kind of cheesy. We took a photo all wearing Anthony Thomas jerseys, and um, we were basically wrote this nice letter saying we would love it if you could kind of, um, you know, Instagram us or tweet us or kind of show your support for Cabo Care, a local Oregon startup. Um, and uh, we didn't hear back from him, so it was kind of a bummer, um, and we were a little disappointed. Um, but then a month later, just out of the blue, he private messages, private messages us again on Twitter, and he's like. Hey, um, can I get some more hats? <laughs> <laughs> my teammates stole them my from me. My teammates stole them from me. And, I, and then, uh, so we had, we, had uh, we had just done an event down in, uh, 
Or that was San Fran. We were at yeah. it was at the Pac-12, the Pac-12 championship. championship against Arizona. And we had just driven back nine hours, and I get a call from Chris, and he's like, "Hey, uh, check your Twitter. Anthony Thomas is trying to talk to us right now." And so I forget you were out or something with the kids, and I, <clears> I jumped on my computer. I was exhausted, and I see this message from Anthony, and I'm kind of in a bad mood, and you know, I've just been traveling all day, and so I'm so skeptical with this. <laughs> And this, I just feel like he's trying to just squeeze as much free hats as he can from us. So I'm, I'm like, yeah, we'll send you some hats, but will you like Instagram and tweet us? And he's like, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure, for sure. And I was like, okay, how many hats do you want? And he's like, give me four. And I'm like, oh God, he's totally gonna milk us right now. And so I was like, okay, I will send you hats if you promise to tweet us and Instagram us or Facebook us. And he's like, he just sends three words, I got you. And so I was like, all right, I'm doing this. So pack up some hats, send them out, express. Um, and six weeks after our first contact with him, and maybe a week or two after this, um, he reaches out to his Twitter followers, his Instagram followers. Um, and I know this one post alone got 13,000 likes, uh, 250 post comments. We doubled our Instagram followers in a couple of hours. Um, and we had new followers on our Twitter and our Instagram from uh, other Kansas City pro athletes, a couple players on the Royals baseball team, a couple players on the Chiefs. Um, and so it was awesome. And a lot of validation too. A lot of comments we read were very positive. Where can I get this hat? That's, that's awesome. Um, so, And so also to take advantage of that, we have a section on our, on our website called What the Buck, which is a section where if you don't see, uh, obviously we only have Ducks hats now, but if you don't see a team or a school or a state or whatever, that you would like to see, let us know. Email us and we'll, we'll try to work through it. And so we've been collecting a lot of feedback from people saying, oh, can I get a 49ers one? Can I get to see it today? I got Arizona, 49ers, Colorado State flag. We've been getting a lot of feedback that way, which is great marketing or a great way to validate and say, oh, hey, we got people who want this and we need to show stores in Colorado that, we, that people really want this hat. So we take all this feedback and use it to kind of push out to our distribution channels and say, hey, people really want this hat. You should start carrying us. Sidebar, back to Derek. Cool. <laughs> so uh, that's the the end of the Anthony Thomas saga. Oh, oh we, we've got maybe. some, maybe. We've actually got some cool stuff we're doing with him. Um, yet to be released, but pretty exciting, pretty exciting stuff. Um, so anyway, the third prong um, is uh, local events and finding those local events to kind of show the Cal Bucker offense. So something that's been important to us is being available at all the football games, uh, being there at a ton of events. We've tailgated uh, at San Fran, we've tailgated at Pasadena for the, the Rose Bowl, um, and Whitney, the third member, the reason she's not here, um, she was out at the national championship game rocking Cal Buckers. Um, and so uh, that's been important to us and it's been important to our fans too. Um, we'll, we'll have a map, you know, saying, tweeting out, you know, come and find us. Uh, we'll give you guys some free beer, we'll give you guys some hot dogs, hang out for a little bit, and we had fans that we don't know just show up to our tailgate and say, hey, you guys are the Cowbucker guys, and we'll, you know, <coughs> share a beer with them and, you know, give them a hamburger. It's been a lot of fun meeting people that way and getting the brand out that way. So look for us at uh, the home game tailgates uh, next year. Other local events, um, we've uh, partnered with a couple of the other yeah. programs here on campus. Um, yesterday we partnered with uh, the Rec Center and the EMU. Um, both of those uh, places had different watch events um, for the national championship game, um, and so we did a program. We did an event with them. Um, first 100 people to go to each of these programs, we get a free bucker. Um, both of those uh, events had you know awesome turnouts. Um, this is a, a photo that was taken last night of a bunch of fans wearing cow buckers behind Channel 8 News, uh, trying to get on TV uh, during the game, which is kind of cool. Um, and and. The cool thing about this, and we'll talk about social media in a second, is you know they're tweeting pictures out. The people we're partnering with are tweeting pictures out, and so we're retweeting, we're staying involved, we're keeping our fingers on the pulse that way. So, so this is kind of the the four prong approach that we've kind of identified early on. Um, this is kind of the one that's so interrelated into all those things, um, social media, and so. I can't stress enough how important social media has been for us as a startup um, with very limited capital um, and trying to extend our reach as far as possible. So we kind of have, we put together a little bit of a list um, today, uh, kind of talking about some of the rules that we try to follow throughout Twitter, throughout Facebook, throughout Instagram. 
um, and uh, through our website, just things that, uh, kind of things that we can follow um, for social media that I think might be helpful for you guys. Um, number one, posts with visuals, like pictures, are better than posts without. I think that one for me, I, we're just visual people. I mean, people are visual in general, and when we're selling a product uh, that's very visual, uh, we want to make sure that you know, people are able to see it or you know enjoy it uh, rather than just kind of read about it. Um, but I think that holds true for any brand that we're trying to promote. Um, so generally, we try to stick with visuals when we when we make posts and outreach on on uh, social media as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, Number two, you're not a professional photographer nor an editor, but try to find photos that are framed well and in focus and do a quick edit before you post. I think there's a, a big pitfall uh, with using social media um, where you have a thought, you think something would be really good, and then you can post it um, for the world to see in less than 10 seconds. And so um, I know a lot of people have fallen into that trap. I know we have a couple of times. Um, but uh, I think if you can kind of take your time and um, Think about what photo you're using and do a quick edit before you post. You might realize that what you think is a great post isn't actually that great of a post. Um, yeah, I've had my Twitter card reposted several times <laughs> posting. I'm just getting a hard time. Spur them all. But uh, number three, don't ever post the same type of content. Try new content out. We'll talk about this in a second, but um, we're constantly trying to post innovative stuff. So. Whether it's um, you know a giveaway or we're we're retweeting or regramming or we're doing you know a post of the bucker uh, in Hawaii or we're we're not trying to show the same thing over and over and over again and so um, something that's important to us and something we realized pretty early on is we just don't want people to get sick of our posts on social media and so we really try to kind of change it up a little bit and that's that's a hard one but um, something that we try really hard to do. Uh, you had a number four. You want to talk about that? One? Uh... Yeah, so this is again, I've, like I said, I've had my Twitter card revoked because I would tend to post, just have a feeling that I really wanted to get out there and I put it out there and then I would come into the office and Derek would look at me like, dude, no, that was bad. Or Whitney would, I would get an email from Whitney in LA and she'd be like, why, why, just question marks. I'm like, come on. So probably the biggest lesson that I've learned, especially if you want to increase the reach of your posts, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, whatever, is to post at people, not or to post to people, not at people. So when I'm talking about oh, this really good idea, even if it's you know, is this gonna blow up? Okay. Uh, so what I've realized is that when I'm just kind of posting my emotions or thoughts after a game, a good game, a bad game, whatever. That's just kind of putting words out there for the world, and people don't really care about that as much. We found that people really respond a lot better when we're posting at somebody. So we say, at the pit crew, thanks for repping really well at that game. It was a real emotional win. Or at the duck store, you know, the hats look great. You know, good luck in Pasadena. Things like that people really respond to. Um, if you're even, it doesn't have to be a specific person, but it could be a company or somebody you're doing promotions with. Just Every post, hashtagging or adding, this is this is who I'm directing it to, so people kind of get some context to the feeling that you're trying to put out there. Uh, number five, you can be smart, funny, and quirky without being alienating. Um, we'll, we've seen this a lot with other companies. I think sometimes um, comments are made on social media that kind of divide the people you're trying to talk talk to or talk with, um, and we try and stay as. Um, we want to we want to be a part of the conversation, but we also just don't want to alienate or offend anyone. Um, and so I think everyone's tolerance level is going to be different, but just as a rule of thumb, we, we try and be smart and funny, try not to be as mean or mean spirited. Um, number six, interact with fans who are trying to interact with you in a positive way. Uh, you know, people are commenting on our Facebook wall or our Twitter. You know, working by the hat. Um, these hats look great. This is awesome. I, having a conversation with those people is is helpful for not only the person that you're talking with, but for people that come across that stream later on. Um, and so we're, we're usually pretty quick to respond to those comments. Um, the, com the comments that we're less likely to respond to are the ones that say, like, what the hell, this is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. So um, You can hide posts on Facebook, which is awesome. Um, we, we, I think we've only hit one or two, but there's been some, 99% uh, of the comments we get are very positive and um, want to know where they can get the hat or want to know when they're going to get the colors that they want. 
uh, one or two comments over the last few months have been like, this is so ugly, man. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know that you've made it when you get haters. Yeah, yeah. that's what we tell ourselves. So I'll take it. Um, number seven, sometimes none of these rules apply and the post can still be awesome, but more often than not, it's been helpful for us to follow these guidelines. So take these with a, a grain of salt, um, but these have kind of been the rules that we've found to be helpful over the last few months. Yeah. Say it out loud before you type it. If it sounds stupid when you say it, it's going to sound stupid when you type it. Shoot. Wow. We don't have that, we don't have a specific rule yeah. around, but we're trying to get up a couple times a week something and Again, it's the variety of content more than it is the, the amount of content that you're putting out. Is that a couple of times a week on each platform? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Cry, and then cross-posting from one to the other. Right. It's, Sometimes we'll post the same thing on all three if it's a message that we... So, uh, I'll, I'll show this message in a minute. Um, well, I'll just wait. But we, we go through a couple of different posts that we make kind of regularly. I'll talk about a few of those things. Yeah. How do you deal with comments from haters? Have you ever had to remove a comment because it was just so, so yeah. bad? We've only... Yeah, Facebook allows you to do that. And we've, we've only done, done that once, once or twice. I think, yeah. once or twice. We Normally, we, we, we... It's pretty good about having a witty response. Uh -huh. And so, like, kind of, like, doing a little jiu-jitsu and kind of making it more fun. Right. And I think yeah. that's the approach that we kind of adopted at this point. Yeah, um, so like counter with humor. If you right, yeah, we exactly. put ourselves out there as approachable. We have a sense of humor that tends to diffuse a lot of things and you're like we sell funny looking hats we can't take ourselves too seriously and i think yeah. people will relate a lot better if you you know try to even if you say oh that's stupid like yeah it's stupid but we're having a lot of fun with it sorry you don't like it mm -hmm. yeah on. Mm -hmm. so but we're, we've been lucky i think like 95 percent 99 percent of times are positive so yeah so sorry got two so yeah. like how do you keep coming up with like uh like you're trying to interview and everything what happens when you if you're is there some things you do to like uh, to kind of get over the hump of trying to create something new, or like or do something? So how do we like keep innovating? Yeah, yeah, that's something we we poach. we poach from other people. So there's some there's some amazing um, handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, just like companies that do it really well. Um, yeah, Society, Society 43, which is the company that we've been trying to emulate in a lot of ways. They do some they, cool stuff. Yeah, they kill on social media and they. Um, yeah, they do, yeah. and there's other there's really established companies that do it really well. Like Starbucks, their really their social well. media is incredible. If you guys haven't started following them yet, I suggest that you do because it's just we we take notes from them all the time. Right, and again, it's about posting content that's important to your target base, not necessarily content about you. So we have it's been really easy during the football season because there's lots of stuff that we can put out there. When we hit maybe a lull during this, you know, winter and spring when there maybe isn't as much to post about, that's when we'll start. Being, well, yeah. we'll, we'll continue to innovate uh, yeah. and have that opportunity. And it's just brainstorming, having conversations, looking for inspiration. But um, another thing that I think is important to note here, why you just asked that question, is um, uh, we try our social media approach. We we like to highlight the bunker, but we're not trying to sell the bunker with every comment that we make or every post that we make. I think that's usually, um, I don't know, I, don't, I just don't feel right about selling our brand every single post we make. It's usually uh, trying to reach out emotion, or reach at something that people can relate to, uh, rather than selling a product. I think the selling of the product is a lot, is a lot of times ancillary to the post that we're making. Um, if we can like hit something that somebody's feeling, or if we can let them feel an emotion about the picture or the photo that we've taken, um, Nine times out of ten, I think that's more effective. So, take that for what it's worth. But yeah. regarding number one on Twitter, um, do you pay extra so that your photo is, you know, up there and people don't have to click it? Do you do that? Because um, I know most of the time when I t tweet a picture, you have to click you yeah. have to see it. But I know you can pay extra. <clears throat> I don't think we, we can. haven't done that we haven't really as much. Instagram is obviously all pictures. Uh -huh. Facebook we have boosted posts quite often actually. Yeah, but the the Twitter the Twitter thought so our fo I would I would say and I just posted a tweet last night that had a photo and it showed up. Mm -hmm. um, I think you run into trouble when you have an Instagram picture that you when you you know how you can like click on what social media you want the Instagram post to go to, so you can just press send and it goes to your Facebook or Twitter. Um, I know when you post an Instagram photo to Twitter, um, 
it, 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 it'll never pop up as a picture. I think yeah. it just pops up as a link. So I think people get into trouble mm -hmm. when they try and bring Instagram over to Twitter. But we usually just upload a picture to our Twitter post, and so I think we normally can see the photo when mm -hmm. we post. Yeah. One of the I was wondering if you guys have like, so when do you guys usually post things on Facebook and Twitter? Like, what are your timelines when yeah. you think there's traffic? Because I know there's certain nights yeah. in college, at least during college hours, where there's Where? a lot of people online. Yeah. I don't know how like, people went to Twitter and Instagram, yeah. but I was just wondering if you guys could tell me that guidelines that you guys yeah. used to win the post exam. That's a good question. And I think early on, we had Chris, Winnie, and I talked about doing something where every Monday we would post. So we would have, we would have a different we would have at least one post a day, Monday through Friday, and each each one would be different. So like for me and Crush Monday, we were just gonna <laughs> this, this ended up we ended up not doing this idea, but I actually know this. We wanted to do Man Crush Monday, just have Chris every Monday wearing a, a cowbucker in a different post. Um Stuck at my computer. But we ended up we ended up scrapping that idea. Um, but as far as like timing within the day, um, we usually try and get our 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 social media content out the door by like three or four o'clock. Um, generally, because people stop working around five and we'll jump on social media between like or three or four. Yeah, or three or four. And we like to get uh, like if if we post around three or four and we've gotten enough traction by five o'clock, they're more likely to see that message. So uh, there's no rule of thumb, but it's generally later in the day, but but usually just about right before people get off work. Two questions. Do you use any sort of um, external tools like Buffer or anything like that to manage our social media. Yeah. So we, yeah, uh, Whitney uses Sprout Social, um, and I know she's had, she's used it a little bit, but um, I think right now she's mostly doing everything manually. Um, and secondarily, do you attach any external analytics to this, or do you just use the built-in ones on the platform? We have analytics on our website specifically, so monitoring where clicks are coming from and within our website. But and Facebook has Facebook. an awesome yeah. analytics page for your posts as a business. Uh, I can't recommend that enough. And it comes as standard. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Just curious about with the uh, boosting and posts on Facebook, did you know that that helped a lot? Like. Yeah. So boosting is, uh, it's. It's um, it's a way to reach a targeted audience without them being fans of your page yet. Right. So um, so for we've done quite a few promotional giveaways where we like for example the Civil War the Civil War. And you know what? What when we get to that, will you remind me to talk about that? Because yeah. I think that's a that's a great question. But um, so uh, the fourth problem is social media. And we can we can dive into these questions a little bit deeper. Um, one thing that's been helpful for us is the search. For content out there and repost, retweet, or respond. And so, something that we, a problem we were having the first couple of weeks of sales, we knew people were going to these events wearing our hat. We knew they were taking photos, but they weren't sending it to us. And so, one thing that we did was um, troll the Twitter and Instagram hashtags um, just for the, the events hashtags that were being used. So, hashtag Go Ducks, hashtag Oregon versus Arizona, hashtag Oregon football. Um, and hundreds of pictures would pop up of people wearing our hat. And so, we knew right away, like this is kind of the way to get photos of people wearing our cowbucker that aren't, you know, hashtagging cowbucker or hashtagging at cowbucker or sending it to at cowbucker. Um, and so we've been able to repost this stuff, retweet it, regram it, um, and kind of respond to these people wearing our hats. If they, you know, have a really awesome post, we'll, we'll, you know, shout them out and tweet at them, and um, we'll get them as a follower. So it's a way to incorporate kind of um, people going to these events and bring them into the the cowbucker world. Um, and we found that to be really helpful. Just gaining traction and getting an adoption. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to talk to you more about this. So. Yeah. Okay, no. Um, there we go. Um, one of the points on that social media page was trying new ideas. We have, um, I have a very good friend I went to law school with um, whose cousin is Brandy. Um, and I was at dinner at my friend's house, and Brandy and Amy were there, and they're asking about Cowbucker. They're seniors at the University of Oregon. Um, and they expressed an interest in doing some, um, doing an internship with us. And so we brought them on as our marketing interns, and uh, we had them go to a couple of events, take photos, and it was, it was, you know, they were doing some cool stuff. But um, for the uh, the Pax, or the Rose Bowl game, um, Whitney had a great idea uh, and something that we had never done before, and something we thought would be kind of cool. We knew that people were going to be traveling heavily from Eugene to Pasadena, Southern California, for this game. Um, and we thought it would be really, really cool to have uh, Brandy and Amy um, do that trip uh, from Eugene 
to LA down the five freeway, stopping at all the places that Oregon fans are going to stop at. So, you know, Anderson's Pea Soup, uh, gas stations, taking photos with fans. Um, so they did this, I don't know, five, six hundred mile journey, it might be longer than that, um, down, uh, down the five, uh, taking photos with fans and tw live tweeting. So they promoted this as a social media takeover. Um, and so they basically gave them all the passwords to our accounts and they basically live tweeted this entire trip and it was, it was awesome. Um, we got a lot of great feedback. They did all the events in Los Angeles. Once they got here, they, there was an event on the coast at San Juan Pier. There was an event at um, Disneyland. They went to you know the Rose Bowl itself and tweeted uh, at, the, at uh, the tailgate and again inside the stadium. And it was just a it was a it was a, a way to vary the posts that we were making, um, do something a little bit different. Again, this isn't selling cowbuckers, but what it is doing is it's kind of tapping into an emotion that people at that time were feeling. So we thought that that was kind of cool. Um, and then to your question about boosting posts, when we do boost posts, it's usually for stuff like this. Um, so we had a Civil War giveaway where we gave away two really awesome seats to, uh, to the Oregon versus Oregon State game. Um, and we boosted this one and we reached 13,500 people. Again, like the analytics are all there. Um, we had you know, over 600 people like the post, uh, over 177 comments, 37 shares. Um, and we did something similar. We didn't boost this one as much because we, we didn't were, even have to give out tickets. <laughs> oh yeah, so the we people never the people never the, the the winners never responded to us. We ended up giving them to us to yeah. who did we give them to? Oh, we gave them to Marcel, Marcel okay. Portland, some friends. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. Perfect. Anyway, anyway um, and so uh, we didn't boost this one as much, but boosting does reach a ton of people. And so what boosting does for like five dollars a day, um, which I think is you know for a startup company that's pretty cheap. $5 a day, $10 a day, you can choose your budget. We don't do very much, but um, it's a way to reach a targeted group based on the parameters you put in. So we targeted 18 to 45 year olds because those are typically the people that are really, you know, buying our hats. Um, and we targeted Oregon, uh, specific cities in Oregon. Um, and uh, you can type in parameters that people have on their activities or interest lists on their Facebook pages. So like Oregon football, Marcus Mariota, uh, Civil War, uh, University of Oregon, um, and it reaches those people who don't like your Facebook page, um, but uh, it'll still come up on their news feed. Does that all make sense? <laughs> so, it shows like an advertisement. Right? It shows, so it says like, it shows like a sponsored message. It comes up just like in between your friends' posts. Yeah. So it looks like it's part of your news feed. And so yeah. we've had a lot of success driving traffic to our Facebook page just by doing, you know, five, ten dollars a day for these big cowbucker giveaways. Yeah, um, on the flip side, we've spent we had this uh, package with the with the larger Oregon newspaper to push out kind of clickbait ads on their website, and we've see the the traffic comparison, especially spending a few thousand dollars on a marketing push through a t traditional site versus just doing the Facebook posting. This is so much it's better. So much better. Like, so much cheaper. Like ninety nine percent. It's just so much cheaper and just so much. It's better. It's, I, I I can't say enough good things about. Uh, Facebook targeting and also the data collection that you can analyze after it's all done. Um, so if you're interested in boosting, I just say give it a try. If you're a small business, this is stuff that really works, um, and we've had success with it. So, but um, also another way to kind of hear the posts, we we do these these posts sometimes that kind of again don't sell cowbuckers, but kind of give insight into our company and company culture. So this one we it was like maybe our first week of selling hats. Someone from Tennessee uh, bought our hat, and we've had some weird sales. We've had sales in you know Afghanistan, Hong Kong, uh, Germany, Germany, all over the all place. Of this one was from Tennessee, and so Chris and I wrote a, a quick message. Melinda, thank you for your purchase. You are officially the first person to order a hat from the great state of Tennessee. Thank you for helping our little startup company in Eugene get off the ground. Go Ducks! And we posted it on Instagram, uh, and the person that we sent it to ended up finding us on our social media and wrote, "That's my hat." Uh, and so we ended up talking to them and got a new fan and got a new follower and it's just kind of a, a kind of an interesting way to kind of change up the kind of post you're making and um, be a little bit more relatable and approachable as a company. Yeah, building goodwill amongst the fan base. Yeah. So. And this picture right here is before we started selling, uh, we were at Chris's house. We had the tag, long story, but basically we had to tag all of our hats for our first order. Now we're having that done overseas. Um, but his kids were helping us and posted it, hashtag child labor. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just neat stuff like that. I kind of get an insight into the company. Um, and then, 
this one and show some press. So if you guys are getting press, it's a great way to you know show off kind of the traction you guys are making. This was a picture taken on uh, for USA Today. We had a fan wearing a cowbucker uh, in October, and then yesterday uh, on the Today Show, one of the news anchors was wearing a cowbucker for a segment, uh, which was awesome. We had people from all over the. Uh, well, friends from all over the U.S. say, hey, I'm watching your cowbuck right now on the Today Show. Um, so if you guys got pictures like that or, you know, you, you're getting traction in, in the area, um, you know, social media is a great way to kind of post that stuff and get followers excited about the product you're pushing. Yep. Um, and uh, keep your finger on the pulse. This is kind of a, an overall strategy. Uh, I, you know, watched the game from sidelines last night with actually Matt, who's in the back. And I was depressed. I, you know, I, I left the bar. The last thing I wanted to do was, you know, work. And so, it, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night. I had a couple beers. And I go home and I noticed that social media, on social media, people were, there was a positive attitude about the duck season overall. And so I wanted to capture that with a tweet. And I, I took this photo from the watch party with fans wearing the cowbucker. And I just sent it out. Proud of our students, proud of our team, proud of our ducks. And I, you know, hashtagged and, and uh, tweeted it out and Instagrammed it out. And our Instagram, you know, we got a ton of uh, good responses about that and got a few retweets. And it's just a way to kind of, if, you, if your company can kind of be a part of the message instead of kind of promoting a message, um, that's a kind of a, a great way to be a part of the conversation, which is really what we're trying to do with social media. Right, and note the, the ads in this post, the pit crew, the UO rec, and the EMU, so those are all the people that were there at the event, so anybody that was a part of that event will be seeing this, so that's again part of the tweet, you know, post two people, not at people. Yeah. Uh, are we over time, or? We're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is to speak to Matt Finelli, former collegiate baseball player's hardball question. How does this how does this scale? And that is, like you said, that's a big question. This is something that we talk about a lot and it's gonna be a real challenge for us moving forward because the local events, those things we if we're expanding to twenty schools, we can't be at twenty different tailgates on a Saturday. We can't be on campus doing giveaways to twenty different schools. We can do targeted things. We might be able to hit one camp, you know, one campus every week, or you know, we're still working out that part of it. But our marketing budget isn't isn't gigantic, so we have to really rely a lot on social media to be the main driver of connections with the fan bases at each school. Um, so we still really want to do events at each school. Um, we've got we've got some great ideas that can promote the brand to the general collegiate fan base. Um, but then school specific things we still want to do giveaways to giveaways to games kind of a big rivalry game uh, and promote things that way but also I mean social media is going to be the main driver we've talked to a number of companies that have gone through this expansion process and they say the same thing because it's all about social media uh, uh, so we're, we're going to face really challenging Few months but the nice thing about the collegiate market and its seasonality is that we've got we're, we're going to be launching on campuses when they get back into fall term uh, in the fall late summer football starting we've got eight or nine months between now and probably six months when we actually know what schools we're going to be at so we've got a lot of time to really kind of dive into their social media ecologies and get a feel for who's doing what where and so we'll, before, we'll do a lot of research before we start posting and before we start really engaging ourselves in those cultures. Um, the second point is also one of the ones that keeps me up at night, uh, <clears throat> developing brand equity. We are a branded product right now. Our only hats that are in the store say Oregon Ducks, and the main reason they're selling is because they say Oregon Ducks. When we expand to the collegiate market, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to be selling South Carolina Gamecocks hats or Arizona Wildcats hats, and people are going to buy them mainly because they say those things. So how do you build your own brand while you're trying to promote another brand? That's it's a struggle. Where you know you, we we spoke to it a little bit uh, with the the word cloud and how people see us as a company, and I think that there are a lot of different principles and emotions that we can carry as a company. The way we post, what we're posting about, who we're posting to, um, the words that we're using, the feel that we're trying to evoke, those are the things that we hope that people will, uh, will uh, attribute to us as a company. 
And so we want to, when people think of Cal Barker, they think of the Hess, they think of good times, they think of sun, they think of friends, good events. Those are the things that we want to get across. And those reach across all collegiates and other team boundaries. And so those are the things that we're really trying to put out when we're referencing ourselves. Um, and developing a brand equity is tough because when we're competing against Nike and we're competing against other headwear companies to get on shelves, when people have an emotional connection with the product, that's what we want them to notice when, they're, when they see it on the shelf. And so we're hoping to reach people before they walk into the stores, before they you know, go on to their bookstore's website. We want them to know about us and have a feel for who we are as a company before they see the hat on the shelf. So they can really attribute, again, attribute those good feelings to the hat, to us as a company, and again, being engaging, being relatable, being witty, being positive are all things that I think are going to help us as we expand. Um, and that also talks to competing in a crowded market. But creating, creating our brand equity is one of our main kind of value creation strategies as a company because we're not, we don't have the distribution that Nike does. We don't have a lot of the, we don't have the budgets that a lot of people do, but if we can create again that feel behind our product, behind our company, then we think that's going to be a sustainable strategy. So. That's, that's Cal Bucker so far. Uh, thanks yeah. for listening. So far, stay tuned, and if we'd love to answer any other questions or respond to anything if you guys are curious. I know we got a bunch out of the way, but fire away. Tomatoes, bring them. <laughs> yeah. What did you do with that video that you showed us at the beginning? So that's front page on our website. It goes up on our social media posts every now and then. It's also something that we <coughs> send to potential partners about who we are, what we're trying to build, the yeah. brand we're trying to get out. Um, and, you know, that's actually, it's been helpful for us kind of as, you don't need to read about us, you can just watch this two and a half minute video and that's what we're about. So right. what part of your marketing is geared toward your current, your actual customers? Because your customers, right, are the duck store and you know, other university stores. Yeah. Is that part of your marketing? So we have two, we kind of have two customers then. I mean, it okay. is like the re our retailers, but it also is a large part of the demand that's being pulled at the retailers, which is you know the people that want to buy our hats, um, and so our marketing towards our retailers is pretty is, is far different than our general marketing. It's mostly you know we you know we we reach out to them uh, through different channels. Um, we kind of say what we're about. We have promotional packets that we send to them, um, boxes with our hats and you know samples of mock-ups of what we could do for them. Um, call them on the phone. Talk call them on the phone, them. talk to them. Um, Go and meet them in person. Have you done individual sales of 50 hats through some particular design yet? Or do you only sell to the university so far? Right, well, we, we sell through our website. So are you saying a specific I say a custom, a custom design. Right. We have several that are in production or that are in are in process right now, but the only one that's commercially available is still the Ducks hat. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. so, and we're working with five other collegiate programs right now on designs. Um, that are going to be making a purchase order or have already made a purchase order and uh, we yes. have about 50, 10, 15 others that we want to be in about 15 to 20. We think we're probably going to have to turn schools away because we don't want to expand too quickly and we have a big um, trade show coming up called Camex in February um, where all the collegiate retailers do their purchasing for the next season um, and we've already had interest from programs that are saying just talk to us at Camex and you know, we can talk to well, you. I think if you open it up to a direct sale uh, that you personally sell into some company, they say, I want 150 of those. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're doing that at a small scale now. The problem is because we have, we're only so big, we've sure, yeah. been able to get the Oregon Ducks hats and we can show people, say, hey, this is a Ducks hat. We've done a digital design, but a lot of people want to see something kind of in front of them. This is what it's going to look like. Is it so, really expensive to go to a completely new design? <clears throat> it's more of a time commitment and it takes a little while because it takes probably three weeks to a month to get a sample from China made, and it's, you know, it's, it's, there's yeah, some costs associated with it. financially to change over design. <clears throat> there's there's no, no real amount of research. It's not that difficult. No, I know, you know, they, if we the time work with our partner to sample, and they know that we're sure. kind of putting it out there for our customers to see. And so, cool. so one thing to speak to Shula and what Derek just said was that understanding your buyer cycle, so we, we can market to our targets during the season, we can market to them you know, in preparation, but when we talk to the, the collegiate retailers, we know that they're going to be buying in the next month or two. So we have to focus our marketing efforts targeted on these trade shows, targeted on 
pre-work ahead of the trade shows to get people excited about being there and meeting us in person. So that's, that'll be very, again, kind of calendar targeted at these, at these retailers. And then once we get the schools, once we get the, uh, the collegiate bookstores really excited, they making orders, then we leverage that. We say, okay, we're gonna go now to the secondary retailers in your town. We're gonna go to, I don't know, Fred Myers. We're gonna go to some of the larger places or the other bookstores in town and say, hey, you know, the Arizona bookstore just bought 500 of these they wanna sell on campus. <laughs> you guys should get in on this as well and join us in, in kicking this off in fall. So, so do they have a strange seasonality versus if you were to sell at a larger retailer of you know, sporting apparel or things like that? Right, if we were to sell like a Texas, like this hat can be sold year round, it doesn't really matter. So that was one thing, it was on the slide with our markets, I mean this, or the Ducks ones are highly seasonal. It's going to be peak, you know, end of summer through bowl season hopefully. Um, and the, how, the, uh, how the team is doing really affects sales, how the hat will sell. But something like this has a little bit broader approach, so we're, we're hoping to get to a place where we can have enough distribution channels to sell these. We don't have those yet. We're building up our, our name, we're building up our experience, we're building up our distribution model, our distribution list by selling the collegiate hats. Then we can leverage that to sell our non-licensed ones if they think the product will move. If they don't fit like the spring buying season of a <laughs> I was gonna say that track, I, I ran a track. Yeah. You were out there walking around with these Oregon hats and track meets and things. Oh, we absolutely that is very will. visible. We absolutely will be. We will continue to Big market. We will spring. right. Yeah, we will continue to market at major events throughout the spring. Yeah. We're not done selling ducks. Yeah, I was going to say don't go to the fall at all. Right, but the reality is, and we've been told this by a number of different companies, that football season is when it's kind of when school fan bases passion runs the highest. Unless you're at a strong like basketball school or. I mean, but for the most people, you know, and basketball being an indoor sport is a little bit different. If you want sun protection and you're a real passionate fan, football season is kind of where it's at. But. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, like the idea of like marketing to like festivals, you know, like locally <coughs> here, there's tons of them, you know, yeah, you know like, the main we need to explore that more of that. Some yeah, of that we've absolutely identified yeah. that. Music festivals and bands and things like that is another way to do it. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're working on that. We've got a couple targets to go after, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. Well, you've got like the, those kind of ideas and like irons and fire and everything. Um, what, what's, the, what's the step after that? Right there, actually, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, is it more just going directly engaging? Uh, yeah, I mean, testing the market usually for us starts by getting out of the building, calling people, engaging interest. It's nice now that we have physical products. We have like our non-licensed ones that we can show people and say, hey, this is what it would look like. Um, that are, It's not a Ducks one. We don't take our Ducks hats to Oregon State. This is for sale, by the way. This is just a sample of, <clears throat> we're messing around with okay. um, So having a product in hand really enhances that, but yeah, reaching out to kind of when we have an idea, we have to evaluate, okay, who is our target market here? What are they going to do? How are they going to use it? What will they want? Where do they buy? Kind of understanding the market that they are in and then, you know, saying, is this something that is worth our time? Do we have connections in this market? And just trying to feel out. So we have feelers in a lot of different markets right now. We've had a couple people since we were part of the Rain Accelerator program. Um, and they're, they're great and they have some resources like people who are MBA students who are willing to do research for us. And then, so we, uh, we send them out and say, hey, we really want to research this market, we want to research this market. And they'll come back and say, here's what it looks like, here are the people who are buying, here are the main companies competing in it. Uh, again, one of the big ones that we mentioned a couple times is how diffuse is the distribution. You know, the distribution for collegiate is very, it's very small, only a few retailers that captured most of the business. For something like a Texas hat, it's really broad. So we have, to, we have to really evaluate that along with demand and along with potential suitability of any market. With the universities, um, since you don't really want to expand too quickly, are you going after the biggest names, or are you going after West Coast, or kind of what, what's your, how so are you deciding I, which ones to go for? Our original strategy, 
um, was to kind of have a mix of big schools, small schools, um, and geographic diversity, just so we could kind of test which ones we seem to be successful in. At this point, um, we're trending more towards larger programs um, with big, like big football schools that, if they're in the south um, or if they're in a area, geographic area where football seems to be strong, we've kind of yeah. targeted those schools. Pac-12 and SEC were the first kind of conferences. We so Pac-12, we know it's where we're from. We we have a lot of interaction with them. SEC because everybody who saw the ad said this needs to go on SEC football. So we said, okay, well, we'll call those people, and it's pretty easy. There are 12 teams in the SEC, 12, 14 teams in the SEC. I don't remember. What's that? Did you ever think of, like, I don't know how old you guys are, whether you guys think this is possible, but if you had friends at the University of Oregon that were current students, did you ever think of, like, tapping them as student advocates that could also just push your product and actually, I don't know, give them a cut or something, <coughs> or some kind of sort of reward for getting people to um, like the page or buying hats or some way reporting that? <laughs> we haven't done it for a social media push, no. We've we've had friends, thankfully, in Oregon, friends who are willing to promote our product for free because they really, we know them, they really like what we're doing. It's not a bad idea, we just haven't <coughs> explored that stuff, yeah. So why don't we thank um, Chris and Derek. Um, and if you have any more questions, you guys will hang around for That's a little right. while and you can go ahead and talk to them uh, in person.